I want to take this opportunity on behalf of uh, St. Elijah Antiochian Orthodox Christian Church loca located on 16 in Pennsylvania and on behalf of the Outreach Committee of St. Elijah to welcome with us uh, Frank Schaefer, son of uh, uh, Francis Schaefer, uh, the late uh, well-noted uh, theologian of the 20th century. Uh, Frankie is with us and uh, we are glad to have with us also representing our uh, public relation from uh, St. Elijah D. Morales Musallam who will do this interview with us uh, this morning. Thank you, Father. And we'd like to also extend a welcome to Frankie and say how lucky we are to have you here. And what an extensive background. You're a writer, a director, producer, television producer, screen producer, fiction writer, and have come up with some fascinating books. And I think you have a really big statement to say to society. And I kind of like to start out with this um, book, Sham Pearls for Real Swine, which is representative of what you do. And in it, you bring some interesting points about the arts and the church. Would you explain that to us? Well, my own background is um, in the area of media and the arts. I studied painting and film. And uh, since we're sitting in an Orthodox church, I ought to explain that in the last few years, I moved from uh, Protestant uh, denomination of, of uh, Presbyterianism, and then I was in the Episcopal Church for a while, to becoming an Orthodox Christian. And my family and I uh, joined the Orthodox Church, were chrismated into it. So that my perspective in Sham Pearls for Real Swine and other things that I've written recently is of uh, a Christian who has made a personal journey from the Protestant community into the Orthodox community. And of course, that colors uh, my thoughts on the arts and creativity uh, in a rather new way because most unfortunately Protestantism uh, in the time of the Reformation began by smashing icons and images in church, breaking out the stained glass windows, replacing them with clear glass, getting rid of the liturgy, getting rid of the poetry in worship, uh, taking out the sacramental tradition from the uh, church that had been there for more than 1500 years up to that point. And this had a very devastating effect on the Protestant view of the arts, because the church had always had a place for art in worship, and also understood art to be part of God's creative gift to human beings uh, in the area of communication and secular art. So that for centuries and centuries, um, when one thought of the arts, one thought of churches. That's where the art was. That's who sponsored the art. Uh, not just the religious art either. Uh, after all, it was the church in Florence that commissioned Michelangelo's Statue of David, uh, which stood in the public square. And so uh, when, you look, when you look at the history of the church up until the time of the Reformation, it's one that is involved with the arts, involved with communication on every level. Indeed, uh, it was believing Christians in both the Eastern and the Western church up until the time of the Reformation who were known as the, the, the leading artists and writers of their day, whether that would be Dante or, or uh, whether that would be Shakespeare. Of course, he was after the Reformation, but nevertheless, in the Anglican church, uh, in the historic and sacramentally based worship. And um, so when you come to our own century and you come to the things I write about in my book, Sham Pearls for Real Swine, uh, you come to a period of history where for the first time in, in the history of Western civilization, uh, people calling themselves Christians actually often are against the arts. They're the ones calling for censorship. They're the people who are calling for uh, not getting into the area of, say, film or media or these other things. In your book, you mentioned that you had trouble as an artist finding Christianity or finding a, a, a niche in Christianity that would encourage you, that would endorse you. Is that why you turned to the Orthodox Church, which, as you know, we know is very rich with artistic tradition? I would say no, not really. Uh, my own background was rather different than many people's backgrounds in the Protestant community. Uh, my father, who was a well-known theologian and philosopher, actually had a very high view of the arts and in that sense was not at all typical of the reformational Protestant attitude towards art in that he um, really had a viewpoint that was much more orthodox uh, than his background would, 
would uh, seem to allow for. So in my personal uh, situation, I was given a great deal of encouragement, first as a painter and then as a writer and filmmaker. But as I got to know other people in the Protestant community, I soon found that um, I was one of the only people that I uh, was aware of in the sense that I met other Christians who had come out of other Protestant backgrounds. And to my amazement, uh, very few of them had received any encouragement at all. In fact, most of them had been told that your Christian or spiritual life is separate from your worldly life, that if you have some talent as a painter or an artist, you should be expressing that talent by doing religious art. Maybe not even that. Maybe better just drop your artistic interests altogether and go off and uh, go to, to uh, Bible school and become a missionary or something or serve God, quote unquote, as if somehow one's creative talent had nothing to do with uh, God or Christianity. So my own situation was very atypical, but as I've written a number of books like Addicted to Mediocrity and Sham Pearls for Real Swine and others on Christianity and creativity, what I've found is I've gotten a, an amazing amount of mail from people who are in the arts or interested in the arts and media, whether it's a violinist in some symphony or a journalist someplace, who in a way almost have had to hide the fact that they work professionally in the arts from the so-called Christian community and Protestantism. And fortunately, of course, orthodoxy never in its tradition separated life into compartments of spiritual and secular in this way. And always through its worship, sort of taught by example, and that is that no child growing up in the Orthodox Church surrounded by icons, uh, with priests in vestments, with censors, uh, with the, the liturgy leading up to the center of Eucharistic worship in every service they go to, could ever be under the impression that the visual world, the world of touch, sight, smell, and sound is unimportant uh, because they've gotten it with their mother's milk that uh, the church is actually something that far from spiritualizing Christianity is if it's some Buddhist religion where we worship the spirit or some uh, Hinduistic concept of, uh, of uh, spirituality is actually just the opposite. It has to do with touching and feeling and seeing uh, and it's very physical. And of course, <clears throat> this should not surprise anybody who's at all familiar with the story of Christ's incarnation because he chose to come in the flesh. And the reason that the church, for instance, has always had icons is that, and seen them as essentially part of worship, is that by having pictorial representations of Christ and Mary and the saints and the apostles and the others, what we are telling people visually, uh, but the message is loud and clear, is that this is a historic faith. Christ really did come in the flesh. He condescended to be described, to have a body, to live a life on earth, even though he was the creator. We don't worship disembodied spirits. Uh, we were given a, a real flesh and blood example to follow in Jesus. And therefore, uh, whether it's in the sacraments, such as the Eucharist, that we actually taste and, and, uh, and see, uh, whether it's in the icons on the wall, the life of orthodoxy in its worship affirms visual, tactile, sensory, full-blooded, earthy, if you like, religious worship, whereas a great deal of Protestantism prides itself on the fact that it has no imagery. Uh, they strip their altar bare. Um, and this comes from this strange iconoclastic, this icon-smashing tradition, which tries to turn Christianity into a rationalist system, strip it of its mystery, reduce it to mere cold theology, and then internalizes it in this personal experiential faith where you know Jesus because he's in your heart or something like that. Um, reduce his spirituality almost to like a personalized spiritual drug experience in which there's no external form at all by which to measure what you believe, whether it's the authority of the bishops and the priests, which has, of course, been reduced to zero in Protestantism, or whether it's the visual reminder that we believe in the true incarnation, the true Christ who came in the flesh historically, and that our icons affirm that. All this is missing in Protestantism. So you have to understand that for a Protestant to be in the arts or the media or any of these visual things means that he's going to have to be going counter to the Protestant tradition that began by smashing all the stained glass windows, that began by pulling out all the imagery from the churches, and that uh, took away all the visual representations of the faith. Most sadly of all, of course, the central uh, aspect of worship that the whole church had agreed on for the whole history of the church, and that was the physical 
sacraments of the Eucharist. And once those were gotten rid of, then of course everything else soon followed. And so what you have really in Protestantism is a sort of a Buddhist religion with a lot of Christian words in it about believing in Jesus and accepting him in your heart. But the fact of the matter is there are no visual reminders uh, of the actual historic incarnation of Christ. And so when it comes to the arts or media, you have to understand that the church doesn't regard these as lower than other professions for the simple reason that since Christ came in the flesh, the physical world has been redeemed. And so marriage is a sacrament. Uh, the Eucharist is a sacrament. We have art and our icons for worship. We're not ashamed of physicality. Whereas in Protestantism, there's this very deep prejudice against the physical world. In your book, you say that the Shakespearean works, that works of art, that even the Bible, if they were brought forward today, would not be interpreted correctly and would really be scorned. That out of this Protestant kind of puritanical mentality, you have this fundamentalist pietistic idea that seeks to censor reality. They're embarrassed by the flesh. So whether it's nudity in art, or whether it's the depiction of evil or violence in William Shakespeare's plays, whether it's the beheading of the saint in some medieval icon, and, and pictorial representation of the, of the crucifixion of Christ. The fact of the matter is, the, the ancestors that preceded us in the church were not ashamed of the flesh, they were not scared of reality, uh, and therefore, if something had a violent image in it, it wasn't dismissed out of hand. You know, it was very interesting to me, last year I was in Ravenna in Italy, which has the oldest Byzantine Orthodox mosaics in Western Europe. Uh, um, the, latter, the latter part of the third century and fourth century. In other words, these are the pictorial representations by people who were in the early church, quote unquote, the Protestants keep talking about the early church. Well, what's fascinating when you look at those icons is that, for instance, um, Christ is portrayed as nude, being baptized in the Jordan, unashamed. Uh, no one is, no one obviously uh, in the church at that time, the Bishop of Ravenna who commissioned this obviously was not ashamed by it. They didn't then commission someone to come paint fig leaves on it. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, church um, in its liturgies, in its worship, it's not afraid of the physicality of the incarnation. We talk about Mary's pregnancy with no shame. It's in, a, in fact, it's just the opposite. Uh, she's the God bearer. She's the mother who willingly bore Christ and, and therefore pregnancy and the, the physical reality of how people are born and uh, how they come into this world was elevated and given a new dignity by Christ's coming. So what I talk about a little bit in some of my material is the fact that this strange Protestant division of reality into spiritual and worldly, fleshly and spiritual and this sort of thing really doesn't find its roots in the historic church. So when you go look at the oldest mosaics in Western Europe from the Byzantine period in Ravenna, what do you find? You find uh, religious pictorial interpretation of Christ standing nude in the Jordan in the baptistry, which was the most central part of the worship there uh, before even the church was built. You find, uh, you find the martyrs. Uh, you find the fact that Christianity involves struggling and suffering uh, you know, this isn't Disney Channel stuff. Uh, this isn't uh, G-rated, quote, family entertainment, which really means sanitized, unrealistic, uh, wishful kind of romantic utopian Disney-esque thinking, which is sort of the hallmark of middle America today. Um, this really wasn't present in, in the historic church. Uh, these were the people who were tough-minded. They were realists. They understood sin. They understood depravity. And when it came to the flesh, they were unashamed of it. And so if you look, for instance, at the Byzantine heritage of the Orthodox Church and you consider what Byzantium produced in its artworks and its architecture, this was the center of culture for the whole of the known world, as we understand that word, for 1,000 years. Um, you know, this came out of a mentality that obviously produced a very different kind of culture than ours, which is barely 200 years old and is really in the process of being retribalized and splitting into competing and warring special interest groups who uh, don't even share uh, the common language anymore. Um, here we have a culture that lasted a thousand years. Well, the reason it lasted a thousand years is it had a unified vision of knowledge in the area of theology, moral practice, 
Uh, there were certain non-negotiable truths in terms of what worship consisted of. Today we have 25,000 Protestant denominations, an average of five new ones forming a week. Uh, truth can be everything from two lesbians getting artificially inseminated to a traditional home and no one can say what's right. In the area of the arts, uh, you have this kind of, uh, you have everything from right-wing Protestant fundamentalists trying to censor Huckleberry Finn, all the way up to the other extreme of, of uh, Andre Serrano and Robert Maplethorpe's government-funded projects of the, you know, what, this, this thing called the Piss Christ and this homosexual pornography that uh, was made by Maplethorpe. Everything is up for grabs. Well, the reason it is is because Protestants in their rebellion against holy tradition went too far in their questioning and they began to undo the certainties of centuries and everything was put on the table as negotiable whether that was divorce, whether that was human life and abortion, whether that was what art meant, whether there should even be art. These were things that were never questioned for eons, for centuries, for millennia. Everyone understood these were basic human things. Moral practice, worship was liturgical and sacramental. People knew who they were and why life had meaning. Whether people were scholars or not had nothing to do with it, there was certain basic non-negotiable truth. Now we come to a period of history where because of the Protestant impulse to question everything, everybody does their own thing, truth is in your own heart. Uh, reading the Bible now is just a subjective experience of how you think God's speaking to you personally. There's no tradition by which to interpret it. There's no order in the church. Well, when that impulse of chaos is secularized, it is born the fruit we see around us. Well, when it gets into the area of the arts, you see that very visually represented. And what you see is that we are in a state of complete chaos. And nothing illustrates that better than this funding fight over the NEA we saw over Maplethorpe and Serrano, in which everybody's running around like chickens with their ch heads cut off trying to discuss, you know, whether we should even have art, whether it should be censored, whether the government should fund it. Well, all of these issues come out of one basic problem, and that is that when the Protestant Reformation smashed the unified idea, the unified field of knowledge of the holy apostolic faith of the church that was 1,500 years old, what they didn't understand is that it's much easier to start the process of questioning everything than it is to stop it at some point and say, okay, we'll question these things, but we won't go any further than that. And of course, what the secular world is, is essentially the Protestant impulse of questioning everything carried to the ultimate limit, uh, carried much further than any of the reformers ever could have envisaged. But nevertheless, uh, we're in an era now where one Protestant church will call, uh, you know, banging a tambourine worship, Somebody else will try to serve the sacraments, but with no priest in sight. Uh, no one can say what's what. It's absolute chaos and confusion and anarchy. And, and, and it's produced anarchy in the culture. And what does this do if they, they say art imitates life, or does life imitate art? That big, old, time old question. If you're saying that there is chaos in the artistic world and our artistic expression, you're obviously seeing that kind of chaos in our family structure, mm -hmm. yeah. our social structure. What, what do you see the dangers? Well, there's no question of seeing them. They're here. Um, you know, anyone who wants to predict problems for this culture doesn't have to look any further than the reality around us on the streets. The fact of the matter is the party's over. You know, I'm often surprised in talking to people. They seem to act like the problems are in the future. They talk about, well, where will such and such a trend lead? Well, the worst has already happened. You know, we have a million six hundred thousand abortions a year. A third of the American citizens who are con conceived in this country are now murdered before they're born. Fifty percent of our marriages are ending in divorce. Uh, most families are now uh, abandoning their children one way or another to a secularized education system that is so deficient and so poor in doing the job of education that we're producing a whole generation of illiterates who uh, are more adept at using a condom than they are learning to read. And uh, they can't even get that straight. So the fact of the matter is, it's not is the handwriting on the wall, will bad things happen, where will things go? Forget all those discussions. It's, it's simply the evidence of our own eyes of where are we now. And this is the culture that was produced by the Protestant ethos. We're here now. This is the end of the experiment. What Martin Luther started back in 1517, what Zwingli and all those reformers did, we are now reaping the harvest. Christ says you judge things by the fruit they bear. The fruit of the Reformation is being born in 1992 right here. 
And um, if you like it, fine. Then let's keep going in this direction. But if you don't, then it's time to look at something different. And for me, in my personal journey, what that meant was that I began to go back into the history of the church and the teaching of the church fathers and began to look uh, personally to see if there is such a thing that can be identified as the historic church. And indeed there is, and it is in the Orthodox Church where it has always been, in which the liturgies and the services have not changed now for over a thousand years, 1,700 years plus or more, in which you still have the apostolic inheritance and the authority of the bishops and the priests where it's not a free-for-all, in which the church can still tell you what it believes and why it believes it, in which the worship would be recognized by Christians a thousand years ago because it's the same, essentially, with a few little cultural differences. That is the hope. The hope isn't in some newfangled technical solution or modern psychology. The hope is in, is in looking at the things that have always been true and uh, finding those non-negotiable absolutes once again and going back to them. Do you see the Orthodox Church as having a special place for the family that might help enhance what we have in the family and making society a better place? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we in, in modern America are so overwhelmed by the chaos around us that it is hard for us to imagine the fact that, well, put it this way, it's hard for us to imagine how much we are the odd man out of all world history. This, this is the first culture that has given away the non-negotiable absolutes of human existence to the extent we have. You'd be hard-pressed at any period of history in any culture, Christian or non-Christian, to find a society in which, for instance, the basic unit of the family is, is so beleaguered and abandoned or misunderstood. Um, there's a modern American myth that, that, that this has to do with poverty. It has nothing to do with poverty. Uh, you know, poor Egyptians living out on the trash heaps of Cairo today on uh, $30 a year uh, still have families. Their daughters are still virgins when they get married. Children are born legitimately into wedlock. What's this got to do with? It has nothing to do with poverty. It has to do with the certainties of certain moral non-negotiable absolutes that are above questioning. Does that mean everybody lives perfectly? Absolutely not. But the level of social chaos around us where you see 50 and 60 percent illegitimacy rates in certain parts of our society, where you see a third of all pregnancies ending in abortion, 50 percent of marriages ending in divorce, you have to realize this is almost a first for human history. And we've seen two great firsts for human history in the 20th century. One was in the Soviet Union, in which man was remade on the principles of the Marxist materialistic ideal, in other words, in which political atheism was enforced as a state religion for the first time in history. That is blown up in everyone's faces. And incidentally, the only structure left standing, of course, is the Orthodox Church because of the faithful witness of the people there. Um, and in, in America, we're approaching the, the materialist experiment slightly differently, but it's also blowing up in our faces. So we're not facing imminent economic collapse on the level of, say, the Soviet Union when it finally fell apart. Because there is, more, there is more of the Christian heritage alive here than there was there. There are bits and pieces, flotsam and jetsam, sheer inertia from the past. But you have to understand that the American experiment is blowing up in our face just as severely as the Soviet experiment blew up in the face of the communists. It simply will not work to get into the third and fourth generation of kids who have never known two parents, who are out on the street having, uh, having basically be, been adults from the time they were 10 years old who a way of life is survival and crime and violence. Um, basically, what America is doing incrementally is what happened in the Civil War in Beirut in a few years. And we're going to do that to our whole culture. Uh, it's going to take maybe 25, 30 years to complete the cycle. But you can already see it. So if you go into the inner cities of the United States, what you're seeing there is what the country is going to be like in total with a few oases of peace and stability and some wealthy communities that can protect themselves. But most of us are going to be living literally in an insecure ruin in which the majority of our workforce is unemployable, in which you can have all the new technological inventions you want and they're not going to get you anywhere because the young thugs who are given the new computers won't even be able to read the instruction booklet. And where there will be a level of degeneracy and chaos that just boggles the mind. So. 
What is amazing is all the modern studies today of the results of broken homes and so forth, of course, are showing what any grandmother could have told you at any period of history. And that is you take a kid out of a loving, stable relationship in a home, and that child is going to have problems. Then that child goes off and gets pregnant and has babies when she's 14 or 15, and you're into social anarchy. And so essentially what we're living to see, whether it's in the Soviet Union or whether it's in American culture, is the final stages of the secularist experiment that began when Protestants started to question the fundamental truths of the church that had been unchallenged for 1,500 years. And now that questioning process has reached its apothesis, its final stage. And so the process that began by questioning whether the sacraments were central to worship, where Zwingli and Martin Luther couldn't agree on whether the real presence of Christ was in the sacraments anymore, now we can't even agree on whether the real presence of humanity is in a pregnant woman when she's eight months pregnant and we kill her baby. We can't agree on the most fundamental right to life in our culture. We can't agree on whether a child has a right to live in a home with two parents who love that child. We can't agree on anything. So America's anarchy has not been imposed from without as Marxism was imposed from Western Europe on the Soviet Union, a Western ideal invading a, an alien culture. We're doing it from within. We are rotting ourselves out from the inside. And we are doing it because we are the final generation of those who are unable to ever draw the line and say, this far and no further. We're going to question everything until there is nothing left. Um, you know, it's interesting, as a painter, one of the things that I used to do that would wreck some of my paintings was to overpaint them. I wouldn't know when to stop. I would keep going and going and going and going, and gradually I would create mud, because you can overwork something. Uh, in any area of life. Well, we've done that in the area of philosophy and questioning. We have questioned and questioned and questioned and dissected and dissected and dissected, and there's nothing left of the patient. We have operated on this guy until we've, sep we've, we've turned him into a collection of separate organs spread all over the operating room. There's no patient left. He's been literally analyzed and cut to pieces. Through your documentary, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, in the books, there's a, a negative image. Do you see any glimmer of hope through all these negative things that you've told us today? Yeah, I always do, because the fact of the matter is the, the truth is always where it has been. And the truth is, is not been squandered. Uh, the Orthodox Church has, has kept that alive. And it is as available to an individual today as it would have been in the sixth or the eighth or the third century. So we as individuals can make choices to not be part of the squalor, the chaos, and the decadence. We as individuals can make choices to not be part of the Protestant uncertainty, chaos, schism, and division. And we can come back to the historic church. That avenue is open to us. Now, whether enough people do that so that the whole of society is fixed is, is really not the point. The point is what do we do as individuals? And if you look at the history of the, the first generation, the first three centuries of the church uh, during the times of Roman persecution um, uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire as it collapsed, what you'll see is not that they had some great plan to change society. What you'll see is that as individuals, they began to change the way they looked at things. And pretty soon there were enough of them so that it, it bore societal results. So what we need is not a better plan for society because this society is ungovernable. What we need is individuals who repent of their folly, if, if that is a Protestant folly of just re reinventing the wheel of worships and moral and doctrine, or whether it's the secular folly of thinking that spiritual, fundamentally spiritual problems of sin can be addressed through modern psychology or technical problems, that people repent of this folly, that they see the chaos that it's born, that they repent in their own lives and for what it's done to their culture, and that individually, in ones and twos, they begin to come back to the historic church and to be willing to be disciplined by, uh, by that church to bring themselves back into line with the fundamental non-negotiable truths that have always been there for anyone with ears to hear. And that's the hope. So I don't think it's a hopeless situation at all. But I'll tell you what I do believe, and that is that things have gone too far in this culture for any quick technical fix. And, and they're going to go a lot further. And possibly it'll spiral all the way down into complete chaos uh, or some totalitarian form of government to try to wrest order out of the ruins. But the fact of the matter is, on the individual level, there's always hope as long as there's a faithful priest anywhere. Thank you very much, and to you, Father Constantine, for making this possible. 
Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Frankie, for coming to St. Elijah here.